It is still Christmas tide, and for those of us here in Chicago, we've got a white Christmas this morning with the snow outside. I hope wherever you are joining from that you still have that light of Christmas within you or perhaps around you. I certainly haven't taken down any of my Christmas decorations and won't for at least another week. <laughs> we'll see. This morning I'm going to ask us, maybe challenge us, to hold multiple things at once. I want to ask us to hold the joy of Christmas, the, the spirit of going to tell it on the mountain, as well as these scriptures that we heard read this morning. I want to, before I begin, draw your attention to the image that's on the front of our bulletin this morning. This is an image by the artist Kelly Lattimore that's titled, Christ Under the Rubble. Will you pray with me? O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. O oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Beneath thy deep and dreamless sleep the silent stars go by. Bethlehem was indeed still this Christmas. Her streets were dark devoid of the lights and decorations that typically adorn the city this time of year. Christmas was not canceled in Bethlehem, despite the way that many news outlets framed the story. Christmas came. Jesus was born, but without the usual festivity. Christmas instead came to silent streets as Palestinian Christians and others gathered in the shadow of war. The little town of Bethlehem is located in what was once known as Judea and is now known as the West Bank which is a Palestinian territory occupied by Israel. If Jesus were born today, he would have been born in an occupied land. As one Palestinian pastor put it, if Christ were born today, he would be born under the rubble. Bethlehem is a significant location for all Abrahamic faiths. It is the birthplace of King David, a significant figure for both Judaism and Christianity. And it's the birthplace of Jesus, the Messiah of our faith, and one who's considered to be a prophet in Islam. So Bethlehem is a contested place as is the rest of the Holy Land. It is a land claimed by many, politically, ethnically, culturally, religiously. It's a place I've read much about but have never visited myself. I hope to one day go. And it's a place that I cannot speak authoritatively about. I lack the years of study and experience that it would take to do so. And yet, this lack cannot and should not prevent speaking truth to the realities of this Christmas season. 
The reality is that there is war in Jesus' homeland. A war that cannot be understood on its own, but must be contextualized within centuries of ongoing violence. A war that began with horrific acts of terror and sexual violence against Israeli civilians. A war that has now displaced 80% of Palestinian civilians and developed into a humanitarian crisis with life-threatening shortages of food and water, a war with a death toll now of over 22,000, including migrant workers from other countries, aid workers, journalists, and thousands of children. Another reality is that this is not the only place, nor these the only peoples facing unrest this Christmas season. Our own city is now home to more than 20,000 people who have come seeking asylum. Migrants and refugees whose homeland is no longer a place of flourishing for them or their children. My friends, we can't faithfully celebrate Christmas tide without grappling with these realities. Nor can we faithfully celebrate Christmas tide without telling the full story of Jesus' birth. And these two, they're related. Because the full story of Jesus' birth includes not only this wondrous miracle of a baby, of Emmanuel, but also the reality of what scholar Kenneth Bailey calls the human potential for terror. Matthew chapter 2 picks up the story of what happens in the days following Jesus' birth. His arrival gained the attention of both foreign and local leadership namely the Magi and King Herod. Let's start first with the Magi. It's a bit of a pet peeve of mine whenever I'm driving around before Christmas and I see nativity scenes with the Magi already there. They arrive later. They arrive after the birth. It was common practice for foreign dignitaries to come and to pay respects to a new ruler. That's who the Magi were. They were astrologers and dream interpreters who served the Persian king. And so they traveled from their homeland to honor the one interpreted as the new Jewish king, the baby Jesus. Now imagine their surprise when he was not to be found in the royal palace in Jerusalem but rather in a peasant home in Bethlehem. And imagine the surprise of Mary, Joseph, and the other villagers at the arrival of a Persian caravan on their doorstep. For the Magi would not have traveled alone. That's perhaps another revision we could make to our nativity sets. It should include an entire caravan arriving to see the baby Jesus. The surprise does not diminish the joy, however, as the Magi prostrate themselves before Jesus and give the Holy Family precious and expensive gifts of frankincense, gold, and myrrh. But these are not the only gifts of the Magi. They also give the Holy Family the gift of safety and secrecy. The Magi had previously been called to meet with King Herod, who instructed them that once they were done, they should return to Jerusalem with a report on the child. But the Magi, these dream interpreters, they were warned of Herod's intentions. 
And so the caravan returned home by another road, depriving Herod of the exact identity and location of Jesus Christ. King Herod was a complicated man. He held many different identities. He was racially Arab. His family came from Edom, a kingdom in what was known then as Transjordan. He was religiously Jewish, as the Edomites were forcibly uh, converted to Judaism at the time of Herod's grandfather. He was culturally Greek. Greek actually was his first language, and he was politically Roman. Herod gained power in Judea through Roman support, and he was extremely politically savvy at maintaining this alliance. King Herod has been described by scholars as a brilliant and brutal man. He was willing to do anything to keep hold of his power. During his rule, he executed all the opposing members of the Jewish high court known as the Sanhedrin and replaced them with his supporters. He also executed his brother-in-law, his favorite wife. I don't know if you get to be the favorite anymore if you were executed, but... That's what she's called, his favorite wife, and three of his sons at various points due to perceived threats to his rule. That's the kind of man he was. He was an oppressor, and he knew it. Actually, as he lay on his own deathbed, he ordered the capture of multiple nobles. And he made plans for them to be executed after his own death so that there would be mourning in the city rather than rejoicing. They did not go through with his orders after his death. But he tried to set it up a certain way. King Herod, he was a man who exterminated threats. And that's how he saw baby Jesus. He saw that infant as a threat. And so when his first plan involving the Magi failed, he turned to a deadlier course of action. In what is often referred to as the slaughter of innocents, Herod ordered the death of all boys under the age of two in Bethlehem and the surrounding area. Jesus only escaped this fate because of a dream. Joseph was visited by angels in his sleep and told to take the family and flee to Egypt, where they were to live until after Herod's death. So Joseph, Mary, and Jesus, they became refugees, likely traveling to Alexandria, which at the time was home to the largest Jewish community outside of Judea and Galilee. There the Holy Family would have found sanctuary among their people. And they might have even used those gifts of the Magi as a source of financial support during that time. Yet, the safe passage of baby Jesus, the one we celebrate It does not erase the larger story. Even though we often leave it out of our Christmas services, I'll own up to that, we didn't include these scriptures last Sunday. The larger story, it's one of oppression and power, of the death of innocent children, of the human potential for terror. This, this is the full Christmas story, or at least what we know of it, what has come down to us through the ages. Jesus was born, yes, amongst starry wonder, 
but also amongst violent terror. Jesus was greeted with gifts and heralded by angels, but he was also greeted with a flight to a foreign land. Jesus was born in Bethlehem into circumstances that perhaps are not so different from today's current reality. So we could say that if Jesus were born today, he would be born under the rubble. Or he would be born in a tent city outside of a police station. Or he would be carried by his parents onto a boat that they prayed would make it safely to the other side. The full Christmas story, it doesn't fit nicely into a hymn or onto a card. The full Christmas story, it is miraculous and precious and joyful and horrifying. But we need to tell the full story, especially this year, because it's so relevant and because it teaches us how we might respond to God and with God now. First and foremost, this story teaches us that God is present in the midst of suffering. God is not absent. And even the most horrific of human actions cannot overshadow God's light and God's love. Jesus is still born. Whether there are twinkle lights or not, Christmas still comes. Second, this story reminds us of the importance of our dreams. We cannot afford to stop dreaming of a more just and peaceful world. Like Joseph and like the Magi, we must treasure and honor the dreams that God has given to us. Because those dreams, they become actions that can save and change lives. Finally, this story teaches us that Jesus came for everyone. Emmanuel came to live with everyone. Jesus came for the poor Jewish shepherds. Jesus came for the Magi from a faraway land. Jesus came for the tax collector and the rich young ruler. He came for the Samaritan and the Gentile. Jesus came for the innocents. Jesus even came for Herod. Jesus came for everyone because that is the nature of God's love. And this love must be the basis of our response to present day realities and atrocities, our humanity depends on it. Upon our ability to see that any place could be the manger. To see that any child could be the holy child, could be our child. O holy child of Bethlehem, Descend to us, we pray, cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. We hear the Christmas story, the full story that it tells. Oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. Merry Christmas.